hi and welcome to the video on covalent bonding and orbital overlap. This is going to also focus on hybridization. This is sections 9.4 to 9.6 in your book. Um, so I would recommend along with this video take a look at the sections in the book because that will also help to explain some of these more abstract concepts. So in valence bond theory Electrons of two atoms start to occupy the same space, and this is called the overlap of orbitals. So what happens is some of your s orbitals and p orbitals in a covalent bond start to come together and overlap. So the sharing of the space between these electrons that have opposite spin is what results in a covalent bond. So an example down here shows HCl. So you have this 1s orbital starting to overlap with the 3p of the chlorine. Okay, it's where your valence electrons are, keep in mind. And then the same thing with the chlorine and the chlorine to make Cl2. Right, the valence electron that's in one of the 3p orbitals starts to share the same space with an oppositely spinning electron in another 3p orbital. And that's how we start to get these covalent bonds. Now this is going to focus on uh, overlap but also looking at energy. So an increased overlap actually brings the electrons and the nuclei of the atoms close together. Um, and what happens is they're brought close together until a balance is reached between the electrons repelling as well as the protons in the nucleus repelling and the electron and proton attraction. So when we bring two atoms together to bond, we have to focus on electron-electron repulsion, proton-proton repulsion from the nucleus, and then we also want to focus on the protons attracting the electrons. And so in this graph that we have, this balance between all of the repulsive forces and the attractive forces, this balance is reached when we get to a minimum energy. Remember, we want minimum energy. That's what atoms want. So this dip in the graph is where there's this balance between attraction and repulsion. Um, but if atoms get too close together, so notice this, this is looking at the HH bond. D the closer together right here, really high energy takes place. And that's because our internuclear repulsion gets too great. So if you bring two hydrogen atoms really close together, the nuclei start to repel, which is going to jump this energy, right? It's going to start to have a very, very high energy because that's unstable. Um, but then as we start to come back out, um, our distance starts to get further and further away. And so as it gets further and further away, there's not really much attraction at all. So that's not really a minimum energy either. So it's just important to know that looking at a graph like this, if it's distance and energy, that this valley, this dip, um, this minimum is the ideal bond distance because that's where your minimum energy is. So now we're going to focus on hybridization. And hybridization is actually how atoms um, prepare themselves to covalently bond. So think of hybridization as a blending of two orbitals. So for example, if you add a poodle and a schnauzer, that gives you my dog, right? So Wrigley is a poodle schnauzer mix. That's a blending of two breeds of dog. That's just like hybridization. So for example, an S orbital plus a P orbital gets an SP orbital, much like a poodle plus a schnauzer gives you a schnoodle. So hybrid orbitals form by mixing of atomic orbitals to create completely new orbitals of equal energy. Remember when it's equal energy, those are called degenerate. A degenerate means equal energy. So hybrid orbitals, when you create hybrid orbitals, they actually all have equal energy. So when two orbitals mix, they create two orbitals. When three orbitals mix, they create three new orbitals. All right, so you can't put two orbitals together and expect to get four or five out. You put two orbitals in to mix, you get two out. So let's consider beryllium. Okay? In its ground state, beryllium has the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2. So technically, beryllium can't form bonds 
because it doesn't have any empty orbitals for bonding to occur. But if we put in just a small amount of energy that's needed to promote this 2s electron up to 2p, now we have two single valence electrons in two different orbitals. We can actually form two bonds. So mixing the s and p orbitals actually gives us two degenerate orbitals that are hybrids. So when we add 1s and 1p, we actually get two sp orbitals. Okay, and these are hybrids. So what happens is they have two lobes like a p orbital. One of them is large and more rounded. Uh, one of them is a little bit smaller. So again, we added an s and a p that creates sp. Now these two degenerate orbitals actually can align themselves 180 degrees from each other. Because remember, electrons want to be as far apart as possible, whether they're lone pairs or whether they're bonds. So the two degenerate orbitals are going to align themselves 180 degrees from each other. And this is consistent with the molecular geometry of BEF2, which is linear. So just notice this is actually how this bonding occurs. The bond between beryllium and fluorine, those, that's the overlapped region. And this is looking at the sp hybrid orbitals. So with hybrid orbitals, the orbital diagram would actually look like this. Now I'm not going to ask you to draw an orbital diagram um, for hybrid orbitals. It's just, it's good to know that the sp orbitals, right, we mixed an s, we mixed, we mixed a 2s and a 2p. So the sp orbitals are higher than the 1s, but they're lower than the 2p, which makes sense because the 2s that we mixed in there was also right here in between. So using a similar model for boron, okay, when we want to look at boron, we actually have to mix 1s and 2p orbitals. If you look at the um, electron configuration for boron, okay, we have to mix 1s and 2p orbitals which means we get three orbitals out. We get s, p2. Okay, so whenever you're adding orbitals, whenever you're hybridizing, you always have to add an s, and then we start to move up the sublevels. So we can have one s, we can have three p orbitals, right? We can, because we don't have more than three p orbitals in the sublevel, and then we can have five d orbitals. So we can actually work our way up so right now with this, we're mixing three orbitals. One, two, three. It's sp2. So we actually get sp2 orbitals out of this. With carbon, we're adding 1s and 3p orbitals. That gives us sp3. And again, they're degenerate. They're equal energy. So hybridization is a major role player in our approach to bonding. Um, so there are actually two ways that orbitals can overlap to form bonds between the atoms. And these are bonds that you're familiar with, but now we're just going to focus on the overlap instead of just focusing on the bond itself. So the first is a sigma bond. A sigma bond is characterized by a head-to-head -head overlap. So they come together to get they come together head to head. Alright, so a sigma bond comes together head to head and all single bonds are sigma bonds. Okay, this is so important. All single bonds are sigma bonds. And then we have pi bonds. So pi bonds are characterized by side to side overlap. Okay, so instead of having, you know, head to head, we now have side to side. So with pi bonds, if we have a double bond, Okay, we have one sigma and one pi bond. If we have a triple bond, we have one sigma and two pi bonds. So pi bonds only happen when we have multiple bonds, and you always have to have one sigma bond within that. So then a double is one sigma, one pi, a triple is one sigma and two pi bonds. So again, sigma bonds are always, excuse me, single bonds are always sigma, and multiple bonds have one sigma and the rest are pi bonds. 
So for example, um, in H2, we have this one sigma. Okay? In C2H4, okay, we're just focusing usually on the bonds between central atoms. So we have one sigma and one pi bond because it's double. And then in N2, we have one sigma and then two pi bonds. So these are the multiple bonds. Remember, you always have one sigma and the rest are pi. So bonding electrons, which are the electrons that occur in a sigma or a pi bond, are the electrons that are specifically shared between two atoms, and these are localized. So if we have localized electrons, that means that they are specific to one bond. However, in many molecules, we can't describe all of the electrons that way. For example, if we have resonance structures. So when we have these resonance structures and our double bond can move, these are called delocalized electrons. So in a resonance structure, our double bond can move, which actually means that our electrons can move. This is called delocalized electrons. So just a summary of hybrid orbitals. Always add up your bonds plus your lone pairs around the central. Our focus is always around the central atom. So if we have two, okay, so if we have two bonds um, and zero lone pairs or one and one or however, it's sp. Um, if there's three, Hey, count it on your hand. One, two, three, S, P, two. If we have four, S, P, three. If we have five, we have one S, we can have three P, and we can have five D. So we have S, P, three, D. And then if we have six, S, P, three, D, two. Okay, so this is the table of hybrid orbitals. It does not matter whether it's bonds or lone pairs. Um, you always have to add them up, and that will get you your hybridization. Um, the rest of Chapter 9 talks about the molecular orbital theory. We're actually not going to focus on molecular orbital theory. It's very abstract, and if you take inorganic chemistry in college, you're going to spend a long time on it. Um, so we're actually not going to focus on it much. Um, if you want to look through and see if you have any questions on it, Feel free, you can ask, um, but you will see just by looking at section 9.7 that it is pretty abstract. So we are actually stopping with 9.6. Um, if you have not yet, I highly recommend that you look through 9.1 and 9.2 as well as 9.3 up through 9.6.